came to CSIS and said, you know, I have a, I have a question. We see this growing, uh, growing online trade movement, and we have some real challenges about how to facilitate that, the physical security aspects around that. How do we get ahead of that? How do we frame it? And so through the generous support of eBay and through the brilliance of CSIS adjunct fellow, fellow Kati Salmanen, we said, well, how would we do that? Let's gather some really smart people together and let's wrestle that question. And we wrestled it in uh, a workshop and we wrestled it some more with a draft. And today, the final report is the product of that question and answer. And this is what I think makes think tanks so valuable, trying to get to future answers. As great luck would have it, um, uh, the generous support of eBay, also the timing brings uh, to us today Mr. Devin Wenig, the um, CEO and president of Global eBay Marketplace, which uh, looks after eBay, eBay classifieds, and the favorite StubHub, my personal favorite. Um, and Mr. Wenig is here in Washington. We thought, this is great. Let's ask Mr. Wenig to kick off this discussion. And we're looking forward uh, to your keynote. And then we are going to welcome a very distinguished panel following Mr. Wenig's comments to talk about the report uh, and to offer some reflections about how we fuel this online trade revolution. Um, just as a brief word of introduction, prior to coming to eBay, Mr. Venick was the chief executive officer at Thomson Reuters Market, uh, division of Thomson Reuters. He is the master of disruptive technologies and how to bring this all together. So we need the master of disruption to tell us how the future of online trade. So with your applause, please join me in welcoming Mr. Devin Wenig. Don't trust any master of disruption who's wearing a tie. I'll just <laughs> tell you that right off the bat. So this is great. Thank you for having us. And thank you for being terrific partners. We're really proud of the report, and we're proud of the partnership. And uh, I'll just give a bit of context for why we're here. And then I'm just going to put a couple of brief markers down to give you a little bit of context from what I think you're going to hear from the panel. So. Once a year, we do a fantastic event in Washington, which is uh, why I'm here. And we bring uh, merchants from around the United States who happen to sell on eBay, and we bring them up to the Hill and to the White House and to various places, to regulators and policymakers. And it tends to be a couple of issues, but they're all issues that relate to small business. And these meetings are fantastic because they put a real face on the issues that oftentimes get abstracted in policy speak or in big data. And I'm going to tell you a story a bit later about one of those, but this week feels like it's trade week in Washington. So it's all trade all the time up on the Hill. So great. That's, we care about that too. That's kind of what we do for a living at eBay. And the biggest issue for us this week has been putting a real face on the export opportunity and on the ability for small businesses to meaningfully grow if we, and when I say we, I actually mean a public-private partnership because part of it is technology and part of it is regulation and customs and all the other stuff. And if we can get our act together together, we have an enormous opportunity. And that opportunity is literally to give global access to small businesses. The concept of the micro multinational is real. There are a million of them that are live and well and thriving on a platform called eBay. And there's still a lot of challenges and issues that we need to solve because we've only scratched the surface. And that's why we're excited about the report, and that's why we're, I'm delighted to be introducing the panel. Let me just give a couple of contextual points that I think could be useful, uh, and they're things that I think about all the time. So I wake up in the morning and I basically worry about everything, because in the world that I live in, uh, it's changing so incredibly fast and sometimes you're so close to it, it's hard to see. I'm sure that at the turn of the century when the Industrial Revolution was coming, 
nobody really saw it until it was there. And I'd argue that we're in the middle of an even bigger revolution right now. And it's happening so fast that I've never seen anything like it, certainly in my career. And that is that global commerce is being upended by technology. Consumer patterns are changing, global markets are changing, the entire commerce landscape in the last five years looks nothing like what it looked like just before it. And to me, there are three enormous megatrends that are shaping that. They are mobilization, globalization, and democratization. Pardon the alliteration, but you know, maybe you'll remember something. Um, mobilization is not something, there's, there are some kids that were playing with smartphones somewhere on Facebook. There are lots of kids playing with Facebook on phones. There is also billions and billions of dollars of serious trade that is happening through mobile technology. What I often say is that 20 years ago, eBay turns 20 this year, e-commerce began. It was an internet phenomena. And the internet opened a crack in the door for global markets. And five years ago, it's only five years, the smartphone was really launched in anger. And the smartphone blew those doors wide open. Because what happened is billions of people around the world skipped a generation of laying cable and getting desktop access and they couldn't afford a computer. And we went from about a billion desktop internet connected devices to four billion connected devices in about two years. And this is the prevalence of the rise of the low cost smartphone and all of the associated technologies. Now the question is, okay, so some people are buying and selling some things. Actually, I think there is no uh, non-mobile future of commerce. Let me be that strong and say it that way. My business is now 40% mobile. In the first quarter, we just did our quarterly announcement on Wednesday, in the first quarter, eBay sold $8 billion of goods on smartphones. So if you want, again, some statistics to make that real, um, we're now at a place where we sell about 13,000 automobiles a week on a phone. About a month ago, somebody bought a $1.4 million Bugatti Veyron, I'm told that's a car, uh, on a smartphone on a smartphone. So this year we'll be on track to do roughly 40 billion of trade on tablets and phones. And by the way, we're only one company. There are a few others out there that are technology commerce companies. So it, the, the statistics have been moving so fast it's hard to keep up with them. But this is not a small thing. Mobilization has happened, it's happening, and it is an enormous force. Mobilization has led to globalization because of what I said, the surface area of consumers changed radically in the last just few years. And now you've got billions of consumers around the world who walk around believing that they have the world's shopping malls in their pocket. And this has also changed both consumer demand and the way merchants think or need to think about running their businesses. Our business is about 35% cross-border, and that's been growing every year. We think half the business in a couple of years will end up being cross-border. And in aggregate, we're going to sell about $100 billion this year. So again, in the scheme of global trade, these aren't necessarily small things, but um, the trend is enormous. Consumers are in control. There's no putting that genie back in the bottle. So if you think, well, that maybe uh, merchants and customs rules and other things will be able to stop that trend, that is impossible. Because consumers are in control through mobile technology and are demanding it, and systems are, you can already see, beginning to adapt. Another interesting trend, I'll come to the third megatrend, but just as an adjunct, the on and offline worlds are fully coming together, and mobile is causing that as well. So e-commerce was this cute little thing on the side, but where serious commerce happened was in the physical world, of course. People bought things in stores or face-to-face, uh, -face, and uh, that's the way real trade happened. That also is not a meaningful concept anymore because today um, we think in the U.S. alone over 50% of retail is digitally influenced. 
meaning I go into a store and maybe I scan it and I research it, I research the price on the internet, maybe I go into the store, I walk out and I buy it on eBay, maybe I um, buy it online and pick it up in the store. These, this is happening incredibly quickly. And we think, when we think about our market and opportunity, we don't think about e-commerce anymore. There's a $14 trillion retail business market. That's the opportunity. Anything that's sold in a store can and will be sold through mobile technology and vice versa. That does not mean the end of stores, by the way. I don't believe in that. I actually believe consumers love stores, and there's a reason for stores. They'll be reconfigured, but it does mean that stores have to become fully digitally capable and aware, and probably the role of stores changes, but I'll give my remarks on that some other day. Um, mobilization, globalization, and then democratization. And by democratization, what I mean is, I, sometimes I hear, maybe when I'm in Washington mostly, um, that globalization is a big company, it's a big company thing. It's huge multinationals, and it's all about them, and it, this, is a, this is bad for jobs, and it's, it's, you know, there's 50 companies in the world, and those are the real exporters, and that's what's happening. Well, part of our mission here is to say that is not the, uh, it's great that big companies export, but it's actually the action is with the small and medium-sized businesses. And for us, this is the idea of the micro-multinational. Our role has been to be a technology partner to small businesses and to give them access to global markets. And as I said before, there are, uh, in the United States, uh, for eBay, 190,000 businesses that are selling to more than four continents. The average size of that business, less than a million dollars of sales. So this is real. And the other data that we find fascinating and overwhelming and that we were sharing at the White House and we were sharing with the USTR and, and other places is those businesses that, the businesses that ac access technology are much more likely to export and those that do are much healthier, they grow, they create jobs, and they stick around longer. 95% of eBay businesses export when we were uh, with uh, Secretary Pritzker this morning at the Commerce Department, her statistic is that 5% of businesses in the physical world export. 5% versus 95%. For those 95% that export, we see them growing more. We see that 75% of them on eBay are around three years after they started selling. What's the t statistic for small business health and vitality in the physical world? 15. 15% of businesses last three years. So, you know, I could go on and on with the data, but this is not another thing. This is the thing. This is the thing. This is the way that small business can grow and thrive. And by adjunct, I think it's an existential issue for the U.S. economy. If small businesses can't get access to global markets, what is the path in a globalizing world for the US economy. And I promised I was gonna put a face on it, so I'm gonna give you that one story. Um, maybe, you're data, maybe you're data nerds like me, you don't care about the story, but I'm gonna give it to you anyway. Um, we had 35 sellers uh, here, and one of them was Travis Baird, great guy. I just spent the day with him. We went up to see um, Senator Bennett. Um, he started his automotive parts business in Elkhart, Indiana, right after college. He funded it out of his own bank account with $3,000. He has a brick and mortar location, but he sells his products online. He now exports 41% of his products, and he reaches consumers in 131 different countries. Compare him, so 41% of his businesses export. Um, if I went down the list of Amazon, Walmart, Target, they would all be in the 20s and 30s. So Travis's business is more global than Walmart's business. And what he told me is that he started selling globally three years ago. He had uh, 25 employees and he added 10 the year that he started exporting. Um, and I, you know, there are others. Um, and I could go on, I could go on and on. Um, that is the reality. So 
First of all, I love those stories. They make my job fun. Don't worry, there are plenty of parts of my job that are not fun, but that's one of them. Because it's easy to root for entrepreneurs, and it's easy to root for people that are growing jobs and businesses. But rooting isn't enough. We gotta help them. And that's part of what this is all about. So part of helping them is better and better technology like mobile to give them more and more access. And part of it is public-private partnerships to take the barriers to trade down. What we see is any small removal of friction, tech friction, phone friction, customs friction, leads to better access, more sales, more jobs. Small things make big differences when you're talking about billions and billions of dollars of export economy. So that's why we're here. That's what we do. We've been delighted to be your partner and delighted to publish the report. And I think um, that's enough for me. And we have a fantastic panel. And we're going to invite them up. And they're going to double and triple click on some of these issues that they think about every day. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. The micro multinational, that's my new, that's my new term. Thank you so much. Wonderful stories. With that, let me invite our panel up and we're going to switch over to this side and we're going to give you some details about this new report. So please, panelists, come on up. Well, we're changing our set a little bit so we can see over everybody. Um, let me begin uh, again by just warmly thanking my partner, my co-partner in crime here, Kati Samanen. Kati has been a, a colleague of mine who is steeped in trade, trade facilitation, and we were in just absolutely delighted to be in a position where Kati could uh, join us as an adjunct fellow. She has a day job. She has many day jobs, actually. Uh, Kati Samanen is um, an adjunct professor at the Anderson School of Management at the University of California, Los Angeles. But she also is an entrepreneur herself as a founder and CEO of an equity crowdfunding platform, Trade Up Capital Fund, and the trade research platform platform firm Next Trade Group, but she also does an extraordinary amount of work for the development banks, um, as well as I, we, well, where is she now? Is she in Bali? Is she, where, what trade conversation is Kati part of? Um, and so Kati, we are absolutely delighted that uh, you are here, that you have been such an integral part of this and have produced a magnificent report. Why don't I just turn to you and have you briefly summarize the report, and then I'll, then I'll introduce each panelist maybe as we proceed down the line. Over to you. Great, thank you, and thank you, Heather, for a wonderful partnership. Great to be here, and thank you all for being here. Um, I also wanted to thank eBay. It's been an enormously productive partnership, and we've learned a lot. We've been passionate about this topic, and, and um, the intellectual um, input as well as the partnership has been, has been terrific. Um, furthermore, this is a team effort. We had a terrific group here at CSIS uh, that Heather and um, uh, I convened. Uh, including Marianne Rowden, who is here with us today, uh, giving inputs uh, to this effort. And this was a new issue that we tackled. It's a new, rather new issue for me personally. So I've been, I've been learning as I've gone. Uh, so let me introduce you quickly the report, what it's all about, and then we turn to our uh, esteemed speakers. Um, so as, as Mr. Venig was saying, international trade is changing. We're amidst the revolution. There's no question about it in my mind. Um, um, small companies are entering markets by virtue of technology, have brand new opportunities to access new markets, become exporters as well as importers for the first time. And of course, this is a very desirable objective from the U.S. point of view. We want small companies to thrive, grow, and grow through trade. What better than e-commerce from that point of view? Um, and it's an enormous opportunity. So let me let me uh, recite some of the figures that Mr. Winning was um, um, uh, discussing. When you look at the offline, the traditional, traditional brick and mortar exporters, if you look at US census data on exporters, 
5% of US SMEs export. 300,000 companies out of 5 million, um, um, uh, 6, uh, 6 million uh, employment providing companies. Of manufacturers, about 20% export. But when you look at the online sellers on eBay, practically 100% of them export. 95% was uh, what Mr. Wenig was talking about. Um, uh, so this is a drastically a new um, uh, era where technology enables these companies to gain visibility with um, international customers worldwide, get discovered oftentimes by virtue of being online. And in fact, what also happens, what the other difference is that online exporters, companies that are selling on eBay platform, sell not to one or two markets, which, which is the typical case for a US uh, company, uh, selling to Mexico, Canada, perhaps UK, Australia. Um, but the typical American company, over 60% of our exporters sell to one market. When you look at the eBay sellers, bulk of them export to at least uh, uh, more than five markets. And even the smaller companies export on average to 28 markets. The larger eBay sellers export to 66 markets. They are diversified around the world. They have spread their risk. They are scaling as they grow uh, globally. It's a tremendous new opportunity and public policy should definitely be behind this and, and, and it is. Now there are the, the usual challenges of trade involved in this. Uh, you, if you're shipping goods online, you're selling goods online and you're shipping them, of course you're still confronting customs, you're confronting the traditional issues of trade facilitation. So let's look at what um, the US International Trade Commission in their surveys has found when you ask American SMEs, well, what, is the, uh, what are the non-tariff measures that most affect your business? What are the greatest frictions? Customs procedures, trade compliance, number one uh, issue. Uh, it's some, some burden for over 60% of companies, a major burden for almost half of them. If you think of the tomorrow sellers, the ones that Mr. Winning was describing, companies that perhaps sell a million dollars or so, these are tiny companies. They are few people, they know their business intimately, they know how to leverage e-commerce, but they don't necessarily have the time and bandwidth to immerse themselves into these customs procedures. Similarly, if you're on the import side and you're an importer of record, a small company, an individual consumer, it's, it's onerous for you to meet all the, all the necessary uh, paperwork. It, it can be daunting. Uh, once you get a handle of it, maybe easier, but it can be rather daunting. So the, the question that we had was, number one, how can we make it easier for these small businesses to, to um, comply with trade? Uh, assuming trade regulations are good, there's a reason for them, how can we make it easier for these small businesses to comply? And the more amorphous challenge that we tackled, which is kind of a new challenge, is how do we also secure this trade? Because in a way you might think about this uh, conceptually, we have more and more small companies involved in trade, millions of them worldwide. We have millions, perhaps billions of small parcels circulating around the world by virtue of e-commerce every day. And in a way you might say, well, the, the risk appears very fragmented and very amorphous. We don't really know what all those parcels contain. We don't really know what these new traders are all about. So there is this element of what is this all about? What is the, what is the risk profile of the new trade? And as, as uh, I'm sure everybody in this room agrees that we like to have uh, secure trade, but we also want to facilitate trade. So how do we overcome this traditional tension between security and trade facilitation? That's what the report was all about. And let me uh, conclude by giving a couple of the policy options that our group came up with. Um, and, and these very much turned on much what eBay turns on, technology. So how can we leverage technology uh, to access data to enable companies uh, to, to trade uh, online? And one of the big ideas was big data. So how do we leverage all this data that online platforms, Amazon, eBay, uh, and others are collecting every day when companies make transactions on these platforms? There's a massive amount of data being generated. And if we can uh, deploy this data, put it in the hands of or, or show it to, to government, and um, we look forward to your comments, Mr. Secretary, but, um, and, and get a feel for what, is, what are the patterns of uh, this new trade? What does it look like? 
and get our hands around it, that will enable us to detect risk, detect anomalies, uh, and target the most suspicious activity while allowing this perfectly legitimate trade to flow more freely. The second recommendation that we had actually was Heather's wonderful insight, kind of an a, a easier way for small businesses to uh, comply with trade, whether it's on the import or export side, for them to have a platform, simple platform, almost like a turbo tax, where they would enter their product and they would enter the uh, destination country or the country of origin and so forth, whatever requirements there are, and they would immediately get the right uh, information in front of them and fill the right forms in the correct way. This is a major challenge for small businesses. How do you enter all the information and enter it in the correct way? And perhaps technology, again, could um, ease this, ease this uh, process and, and enable these companies also to leave a paper trail that would, that would make, make it more comfortable uh, for the government to understand what, what these companies are doing because they are oftentimes uh, new. They don't necessarily have built the track record in international trade like GE or Boeing or other large companies. And then the final recommendation, which is probably uh, many of you have heard before, is to raise the so-called de minimis levels in trade, where the paperwork, all of this, is, is less for parcels that are uh, of certain uh, amount. So today, my understanding is still today, uh, de minimis is $200. So if your uh, parcel is below that value, then the paperwork, all, all the compliance requirements are are somewhat um, uh, easier, and it's easier, faster for, for these parcels to move. And um, there have been long-standing recommendations to raise these levels uh, higher so that um, uh, goods that are even more valuable could flow through uh, more easily. So these were some of the recommendations we came up with, and uh, very much look forward to your, your comments, as well as the, the panel's comments. Kati, thanks so much. Um, and uh, as you said, we're absolutely delighted that uh, Assistant Secretary Alan Burson could be with us. Uh, Secretary Burson uh, serves as the Chief Diplomatic Officer for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Uh, prior to this position, um, he also served from 2010 to 2011 as Commissioner of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Uh, so you, we understand about the customs and the physical security. Um, prior to coming to Washington, Secretary Burson served as the chairman of the San Diego County Regional Airport Authority and served in a variety of advisory roles for the mayor of San Diego. So Secretary Burson, welcome and thank you. We would be delighted for your reflections on the report. Uh, thank you, Heather, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. I, I uh, think that this report, uh, from the uh, perspective of uh, hindsight five years from now will be uh, cited as uh, a uh, paradigm uh, changing uh, event. Let me share with you today how it affected my thinking and uh, why I think we have an opportunity to uh, come together so long as uh, with the help of uh, institutions like CSIS or AEI we, we actually can uh, create the, uh, the, uh, the mechanism by which uh, the will uh, can uh, can actually implement changes. So 9/11, uh, 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 after 9/11, on on the September 12th, the way in which we dealt with uh, that uh, attack was to uh, shut down our land borders, as well as our seaports and our uh, airports. We basically hunkered down behind the traditional Westphalian borderline and stopped, uh, for all intents and purposes, stopped commerce. That was the reaction. Uh, as a result of that, the uh, realization that we would uh, deal a catastrophic uh, self-defeating blow to our economy and would have delivered to Al-Qaeda the victory that it uh, sought by simply shutting down the modern economy, over the course of the next uh, 12 years, 13, uh, 14 years, we've evolved an approach that I think uh, with uh, some other adjustments can actually uh, uh, take advantage of being pushed by uh, this cyber development, being compelled to further adapt uh, and to do it in a, uh, a compressed time frame, to telescope changes that in the past would have taken decades uh, will by definition have to take place very quickly. It will make many uh, government officials very uncomfortable, uh, but it will uh, also open up all of the uh, potential productivity gains, employment gains, uh, economic gains that are laid out so well in the, uh, in the, uh, in the report. Uh, 
there is one, the basic lesson that we learned uh, after 9-11 uh, is that uh, we have to stop uh, looking at borders as being uh, lines on a map or in the sand that demarcate countries and uh, empires as they had in the Westphalian system since the 18th century, but rather understand that in fact uh, borders are flows in a global context, flows of goods, people, ideas, labor, capital, electrons uh, across the globe uh, in an intensified uh, and often and increasingly instantaneous way, and that the job of border protection and customs uh, is to secure that flow as far away from the borderline and as early in time before arrival, and that uh, out of that would come a, uh, a, a border uh, and homeland security protection dimension. And then uh, with the help of uh, many people I see in this room, uh, we introduced uh, what is now the staple, the center, the pivot of uh, our border protection regimes, which is risk management and traffic segmentation. The notion that if you identify high risk uh, goods uh, and you identify low risk goods and you identify those goods about which you have insufficient information to make a judgment about risk, you can actually segment uh, the, uh, the uh, traffic uh, and expedite the low risk traffic. And that then unlocked perhaps the greatest uh, key, which is very relevant to the discussion today, which is that the old uh, dichotomy between trade facilitation and security, which in any particular transaction is real, in order to uh, secure it, you have to slow down and look at it. Uh, and if you uh, don't look at it, you are sacrificing security. What we discovered was that systemically, that's actually a false dichotomy and it's a, uh, uh, a misconception of the process, and that in fact security and trade facilitation are the same in the context of risk management, they, they are the same process because by identifying low risk, lawful tra trade and traffic, 97, 98% of all the trade and traffic, and by expediting that across the various barriers and frictions, you actually end up with a security regime because you can focus your rare and your your uh, your allocated enforcement uh, resources on those goods and people about which uh, you've either identified as higher risk or about which you know insufficient uh, uh, facts to make a judgment about the risk. This notion then permits us to say that uh, the way in which you uh, you uh, find the needle in the haystack from a security perspective is that you make the haystack smaller. You don't look at each piece of straw, which is what we did after 9-11. Uh, you don't uh, rely on very granulated intelligence to reach into the, into the haystack and pull out the needle, the, the high risk, although occasionally you can do that, but routinely, and you build into the DNA of your border process this notion that we are going to make the haystack smaller by moving the 97 to 98% of lawful traffic that we can identify. So uh, now we come to uh, the cyber world. Uh, most of what we had designed the system to deal with, uh, as Jerry and Cork must know, two customs officials, mm -hmm. is we designed it for large to large exporter. We designed it for the big company. Uh, and now we get forced by cyber as we are in so many other areas to actually adapt quickly uh, to the fact that we're dealing uh, with uh, uh, many, many more events and actors uh, and they will not take no for an answer. So uh, what, are the, uh, what are the opportunities that we have in the cyber context to solve problems that have been, uh, that have been uh, plaguing customs authorities for generations. Uh, SME, small and medium uh, size enterprises, we have not been able to get them involved in this risk management regime because the costs are too great. Uh, they don't scale up well enough. Big problem. Uh, second problem, 
we have not been able, for all of the talk and the goodwill, been able to bring the public and private sectors together in a much more seamless way in terms of information sharing. This requires us to do it. It requires us to do it because we cannot otherwise engage in the risk management processes that have become central to, uh, to our function. So I, uh, I must say that uh, uh, I think that uh, this development will uh, revolutionize not only business, but it will revolutionize and create a new regulatory regime because, in fact, there is no other choice. Now, that doesn't mean that it won't take a lot longer than it should because of the nature of political process and bureaucratic change. Uh, but I must tell you that uh, if uh, you had told me when I was a United States attorney, actually, uh, in the 1990s in Southern California, responsible for movement across the U.S.-Mexican border, mm -hmm. that we would uh, actually be able to adapt after 9-11 as well as we have so that 10 years afterwards, with all the complaints and all the problems, we've actually changed the culture of, uh, of our uh, government officialdom. Uh, I think that, in fact, uh, we, uh, we, can, uh, we, can move, uh, we can move to uh, both change the nature of customs brokers to become aggregators and verifiers uh, in this uh, E-Trade track pilot mm -hmm. so that we get over this problem of scale by actually creating uh, intermediary mechanisms to to mediate the, uh, the process. And then I think public-private uh, exchange is, uh, is possible. Let me uh, end by just giving you an example. When I say the basic building blocks of this system are in place, is to give you an exa uh, a, the example of ACAS, the air cargo advance uh, screening process that was implemented after the Yemen cargo plot of 2010. And the reason it's so important was that it affected the air, the express air carriers, uh, which account for perhaps 80% or 85% of air cargo. Mm -hmm. And since most of what Kati writes about will be handled by air cargo, not all, but to the extent it's an online ordering and a physical delivery, it will be through the, uh, the air cargo. Uh, let me give you a quick uh, thumbnail sketch of how we solved that and why I'm so hopeful about this. So uh, 2010, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula put PETN explosives into car printridge, uh, printer cartridges and then loaded them onto uh, UPS planes and uh, FedEx planes with the idea that they would move through the Arabian Peninsula into Europe and they would be, uh, they would be uh, exploded over uh, the air in Chicago. Both packages were uh, actually addressed to synagogues in Chicago. Now, I was the Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection. I want to assure you uh, that packages coming from Yemen addressed to synagogues in Chicago would have been looked at. <laughs> and they were targeted for review, but they were targeted for review in the O'Hare mail depot in Chicago. And of course, the terrorist act would have been completed beforehand. So as the Abdul Muttalib event had revolutionized passenger screening on Christmas Day 2009, so this event led to, uh, to the uh, uh, ACAS. And the way it happened, basically, was John Pistol was the head of TSA. And I, uh, I called John and I said, look, we could do this the, the, we could either do this the old-fashioned way which is wait for there to be a congressional hearing and then have a, a legislative uh, solution imposed on the private sector and on the public sector, as in the 10 plus 2, the ISF uh, uh, um, uh, earlier in the decade. Or we can actually uh, bring the private sector in and co-create the solution. And. Uh, what had led to that was uh, six months earlier, I had been at a DHL hangar in Kennedy Airport, and I said to a middle manager, I said, you get all of this information weeks in advance about the shipments that you have. You have very sophisticated data systems. Why don't you share that information with us 
And the answer was because if we give you that information, you will inspect more of the packages. And I remembered that very carefully. And the predicate or the, the driving force of this ACAS was bring in the private sector, and they all participated, the express carriers, and co-create a system of advanced data sharing so that, in fact, you could mitigate, identify problems and mitigate them way in advance of the shipment date. And in fact, the number of inspections became a fraction of what it had been before because in fact the private sector, the air express carriers, were dealing with all of the issues that were raised well in advance so that they did not have to be exposed uh, they did not have to be uh, uh, inspected when they got to the Westphalian borderline. So that is the outline of what I think is the, uh, is the uh, first uh, approach here in addition to the de minimis and informal entry issues that Kati talked about. But you have advanced data sharing, risk assessment, mitigation by the private sector, and that solves, that is the germ of a new regulatory regime. Uh, Paul Valéry, the French poet, said, the challenge of our times is that the future is not what it used to be. Uh, we, we can seize the moment and in concert with think tanks and the private sector, we can devise a new regulatory regime that will serve uh, the world economy. Thank you. Oh, that's just terrific. Thank you so much. And thank you for your, your time uh, and, and, and engagement in our process. Marian Roden, President and CEO of the American Association of Exporters and Importers. This is near and dear to your heart, and you've been a wonderful colleague to us. I'm going to quickly turn this over to you, and then we'll have our benediction by Jim Lewis, the CSIS Director of a Strategic Technology Program. Please. You. And you need this. Yes, yes. ma'am. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to participate. When Kati uh, invited me to a, sort of a think session, I guess, idea yeah, session last year, I was running in between, we built a new office, and um, I just had about enough time. And it was really a revelation. I, I literally had an out-of-body experience because I follow uh, Charlie Munger, who is um, uh, the partner to um, Warren Buffett, who gave a, a great line, uh, when faced with an intractable problem, turn the, problem, the question on its head. And the two questions that I had when uh, we were talking to uh, eBay and other people uh, about this issue is, knowing our trading system and the trade compliance and security protocols, how do you deal with uh, risk that is diffuse, right? I mean, the top trading companies, the top 1,000, the top 10,000 multinationals are responsible for 70% of the trade. And even within that, 70% of that is traditionally intra-company trade, you know? So um, the numbers that Mr. Wenig was talking about, you know, hundreds of millions of people trading, the government is just not set up to deal with it. Uh, so that's the first problem. The second problem is how do you facilitate trade that is not necessarily regular trade. So, for example, a pharmaceutical company will have a shipment of, you know, their blockbuster drugs every Wednesday at the Port of New York, New Jersey. That's not necessarily the case with companies that are using eBay as its uh, platform. So I want to show you just quickly uh, what the current uh, world is in trade compliance. And this is a chart um, my parents um, helped me spend $40,000 on a law school education so I can draw uh, <laughs> charts for Congress. But, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And this is the risk segmentation that Mr. Burson referred to. Um, and we are in the middle of um, implementing the President's executive order on streamlining export import processes for America's businesses. It was a huge uh, advancement. And I had written the um, legislative provision in the Safe Port Act to mandate ITDS, which originated with Al Gore's reinventing government in the 1990s. And finally, we have an executive order that will implement it by next year. But we do need to bring all those government agencies to follow customs lead for electronic data. 
And uh, we've come up with a white paper uh, of showing uh, agencies actually how to do it. And we want to leverage the dollars that private enterprises are spending already on compliance. Uh, so we really have to uh, get the agencies to learn how to do risk management on an account basis, which they really don't do. They do it on a transaction basis. And so we I put agencies in different buckets. We have four buckets. So this is the commercial compliance uh, bucket, which is primarily concerned with miscibility of goods and uh, collecting customs revenue. But what the agencies really need to do is they need to look at what are the factors contributing to the risk profile of that company. And what we're basically going for here with these risk, factor is, these risk factors is how new is that company to importing or exporting and how complex is that business? How many source countries? How many market countries? The more complexity, it's not how new the company is, it's how complex is that business and how many product lines. And you can get to a risk score. And then you want to flip it on its head and saying, okay, now given that risk profile, how is that company mitigating the risk, okay? How do they deploy their dollars? Are they deploying dollars in security programs and trade compliance programs? Do they adopt uh, best industry uh, practices? Uh, do they have internal controls? Uh, have they been audited recently? Now, you know, in the social responsibility areas and many of these areas, as Mr. Burson was uh, discussing with Templus too, we're tr really trying to pull back from an audit-based system because it is so labor intense. And when you're dealing with hundreds of millions of traders, it is not going to work. So the irony is yesterday I was at the TTIP negotiators, uh, negotiations in New York, um, doing a uh, presentation on this system because we'd like to use this as a proof of concept with US agencies and then go to the Europeans and TTIP and saying, we think this is a way to bridge the regulatory gap between the US and the EU. This will not work for the eBay companies. Uh, because it requires dollars up front and people to administer this system. Um, and we know trade patterns are changing. When I first came to the association, we had our big importers, most of the textile companies and retailers, and we had our big exporters like Boeing. A couple of years ago, I went to the BIS update in July, and Toyota was there. I'm like, what are you doing here? Last year, I went and Walmart was there. I'm like, what are you doing here? So trade patterns are changing. This week being uh, the week of trade, as Mr. Wenig said, and the president is advocating um, TPA and TPP saying, we want the United States to write the trade rules of the 21st century. Now, that is certainly true, but don't tell the trade negotiators, but they're not writing the rules. This is gonna write the rules for the 21st centuries, because it's gonna be based on customer demand for product, and the ability of companies using electronic platforms to supply those goods anywhere in the world. Um, and we have a huge opportunity with the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement to try out this pilot um, so that we can see that it works and come up with a proof of concept. The eBay companies have won half the battle. When Mr. Burson was commissioner in the past decade or so, we struggled with the data. Who has the data? Can they get it into the government's pipeline at the right time for the assessments? That world is coming to an end, I think. The eBay model of an electronic um, selling platform, they have the data. So that's not the problem. The issue is can we scale it appropriately without being so um, labor intensive for the companies to do a risk management system that will probably be um, self-correcting uh, uh, self uh, using the career services, using the intermediaries that they use to physically move the goods. And that is our big challenge, uh, but we are certainly up for it at AEI and hope to be a part of it. 
Marianne, thank you so much. Jim, um, as a director of our strategic technologies program, but also a former senior commerce official, State Department official, you have lived in this world. I think you've negotiated some of these uh, various uh, types of things. I'd love to get, in concluding, uh, thoughts from you on both the project, the challenges, and the opportunities. Jim, to you. Uh, thanks, Heather, and thanks to everyone else on the panel. Uh, great report, a lot of fun. The statistic that I picked out was the, in the eBay remarks is the survival rate of small companies, and that's really significant, mm -hmm. right? So that you look at, you want startups, you want new companies, you want entrepreneurs, and most of them fail. One advantage in this country is it's okay to fail, <coughs> but eBay reduces the chance of that, so there's a huge uh, benefit to this kind of trade. Let me talk a little bit about this. One of the problems we've had is uh, measuring the digital economy, measuring intangible trade, intangible transfers. And in fact, we tend to undervalue it, and that's reflected in the policy. And people are trying to adjust to this, and the OECD did a report. You've seen uh, GDP figures bumped up a little bit as people, people try and get a better, better handle on um, digital trade. I got off the plane last night at 2 in the morning, so I'm not going to be speaking English for the rest of my talk. <laughs> uh, when we get better measurements, we will do better at adjusting policy, right? And I think this is one of the goals for the next few years is our economic measurements don't adequately reflect uh, the digital economy. So that would be a good goal. Reports like this help. Um, second thing to think about is you heard a lot about disruption. Uh, you know. I don't, I don't always like the word disruption. It sounds, anytime it sounds like a PR firm came up with it, you should always be suspicious. Uh, big data, cloud, disruption. It's not really disruption, it's, it's change, right? And this is a predictable, disruption implies sort of discontinuity, right? This is continuous change. It's just at a much rapider rate with many more people involved. And in looking back at the industrial revolution, one of the things I was thinking about, during the speeches, it's not really that change is, is that much faster in some ways, it's just that there's so many more entrepreneurs, there's so many more companies, that it gives the impression that it's very difficult to manage, and that's part of why coming up with good statistics would be useful. We need to get a window on uh, how do we actually scope this change out. From a technology point of view, change really isn't that rapid, and we were talking about eBay, I was on one of the I was on the e electronic commerce working group that helped commercialize the internet um, 15 years ago, and we were talking about mm -hmm. eBay and these problems. So it's not technology, it's more the lack of measurements and a couple other things. Well, there will be change, right, and it will be dramatic. And I think, you, you know, when uh, every time I drive down uh, Pennsylvania Avenue and go by the site of the old Tower Records, right, for those of you who are old enough to remember that, um, Tower is gone. It was a four-story store. I loved it. You know, CDs, tapes, everything. No one, no one buys from record stores anymore. That's the kind of change we're going to be seeing. And just if I can be a little science fiction-y for a minute, um, some of the other things we're looking at is uh, robotic delivery. Uh, I think robots are, are going to be uh, much more important. And when you think of smart cars or drone delivery, the first time someone told me, you know, Domino's is going to deliver pizza by drones, I was like, oh, go away. Um, but, but this will happen, right? We will get to that point. Uh, autonomous agents, we've been talking about this for a long time, more than a decade. You'll have software programs that represent you in these online markets and will make deals for you and will buy things for you. You will not be doing your own purchasing anymore. And then you will, may not even be picking the stuff up anymore. Some machine will be delivering it for you. So. That one a little further out, but that's the future we're looking at. And of course, when people hear this, what they say is um, sort of the old Luddite thing, jobs will go away. Jobs will go away, but others will appear. Uh, you know, if you, if you didn't want to do, uh, if you wanted a more hands-on type job, robot repairment's gonna be a, a growth field. <laughs> we know that, right. And so the picture, I'm gonna post this picture eventually. Um, it, all companies have had computing sections since the turn of this, the 19th century. And you can find the picture online. Type in computer, computing section 1950. And you've got a picture of rows just like this with dozens or hundreds of people sitting in front of, of uh, uh, calculating machines, you know? 
with a little tape coming out, doing the numbers, they've been replaced by computers. And they were white collar jobs. And so that was the end of the American economy when that happened in 1920, as we all know. No, of course not, right? This will be a tremendous boost to productivity. Jobs will go away, but new ones will appear, and we will be wealthier. Uh, there are issues, right? How do you authenticate identity? I think that's going to be a problem for online commerce. We don't do a good job. Uh, I've only been working on authentication for about 20 years, and I've clearly failed. So maybe someone can do better. Uh, data protection and privacy. Um, currently, it's not only unregulated in many parts of the world, but the regulations that exist are discontinuous, right? So what you have to do in Europe or in China or in Japan or in the US are different. This will be a barrier to trade. And it's not going to get easier as people wake up and say, wait, I want my data to stay in my country, right? It's interesting when you look, it's the companies that push back against this. So the Brazilians originally thought of a law that said commercial data for Brazilians will stay in Brazil. And it was the Brazilian companies that came and said, no, don't do that. But we're going to have to figure out some way, and this is where the report is helpful. How do you get agreement on these things, on data protection and privacy? Finally, there's the non-tariff barriers to trade. Uh, in talking to some Chinese officials, they um, like the fact that uh, they put constraints on companies like eBay because they think it helps them build domestic champions. Could be true, right? So we're going to have a problem with that, is when, when do you get one of the largest economies in the world to play by the rules? Um, finally, let me talk about politics real quick, because th this is CSIS, so we have to talk about politics. Um, this is a political issue, and sometimes people say, oh, well, government moves too slow, policy moves too slow. You know, look at how fast things are changing. We need to move faster. Um, governments move at the speed at which their citizens wish them to move, right? So it's not that government is moving too slow, it's that citizens are being cautious or they have concerns that aren't being addressed. How do we address that? Governments aren't going to go away. What we're seeing now is not the end of sovereignty, but the extension of sovereignty. It's governments experiment with how do I extend sovereignty into the online world, into online commerce, right? And that will be the challenge for us, is can we do this in a way that allows us to seize the economic opportunities that the new technologies will give us? So that's where I am. I think this is great. Um, just love the data in here. I am a, a data nerd, I guess. <laughs> Data nerds unite. Uh, thank you, Jim, and thank you also for, you know, be there. We, we're going to have to work hard on this, absolutely for sure. Lots of issues. I know the hour, and we promised uh, 145, and I know, Jim, you have to depart, but I just thought, uh, well, we have this incredible talent here. If we, if you could all indulge me for three extra minutes, could we take one question or two from the audience, and then why don't we just take one question? You can fire it at any of the... Uh, Panelists, six minus so, so Jim. Make it a really long question. Yeah. Sure, I'll make it a really long question. No, really no short. first of all, please identify uh, Roger Libby with DHL, and I do want to thank all the panelists, but especially uh, Assistant Secretary Burson for his work in his previous role at CBP. Because honestly, the work with ACAS, uh, and I was fortunate to be invited into the room the week after Yemen and sit down with uh, Deputy Commissioner, now Deputy Commissioner McAleenan, to find the solutions. I wanted to point out what worked there and why I have a challenge now to all the panelists on this topic. What worked there was government not coming to us with the solution and saying, you implement this, but rather the problem. I need advanced data to do targeting. How can you business do that in a way that works? And we weren't certain we could trust CBP at that point, but it all worked out. We're very happy for it. Uh, I heard that the topic, one of the topics that the express industry cares about a lot, which is de minimis, because it's facilitating for these small and medium-sized enterprises that don't want to get into the big customs work, how they can move those low-value goods across borders quickly. Uh, yesterday, when the House uh, passed, in the committee at least, the customs reauthorization bill, it included a provision to raise de minimis in the U.S. from 200 to 800. This is great. We've been advocating for this for, when Mike Mullen was here from EA uh, a minute ago, we've been advocating for this for about six years specifically in the U.S. But our next step is how do we get the other trading partners to raise their de minimis levels? And it's always been tied to value-added tax or to how you calculate it and all these other barriers that people throw up to try to say it's a problem. How can we now use this example of ACAS where we take government saying this is a problem, an industry with how we can work with you, and look at finding a solution to take those things like VAT 
calculation, which is not going to go away. Countries aren't going to give up their value-added tax, but take it away from being an impediment at the border that slows down and adds that friction that Mr. Venig was saying earlier. Secretary Bruce, I'll let you answer that, and then Marianne, maybe two seconds, and then we'll conclude. The, uh, the short answer is that uh, it, it cannot be, uh, increasingly we have to address this in a multilateral uh, fashion. And the politics, we still have a, all, all of this is still based on the nation state Westphalian system in terms of regulatory regimes. We don't have a world government, we don't have uh, regional governments. But I think uh, my sense is that uh, taking the, uh, the issue of encryption, for example, uh, and the competitive pressures that attach to that in the cyber context, that more and more you're going to see the, uh, the uh, re necessity for multilateral approaches to these issues. Because there is no other way to do it without losing competitive advantage to uh, some other nation state. So it starts in a smaller group of nations that trust one another, more or less, and then it grows out because it becomes uh, the, uh, the, obvious, uh, the obvious solution. It's the old Schopenhauer uh, wisdom. Uh, every truth passes through three stages. In the first, it is ridiculed. In the second, it is violently opposed. In the third, it's regarded as self-evident. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I think we're going. That's a good one. <laughs> there you go. Go ahead. From the industry perspective. I take a different tact. Uh, one of the things that I did during the or after the recession is read a lot of um, books um, from different perspectives about the causes of the Great Recession. But um, what happened, I think, particularly in the private sector, the most important question to ask is, how do you get paid? And you find out a lot. That's all you need to know. What this is going to pose for governments is how do you tax? Our companies here are so successful because in our wisdom, we didn't tax them to death. Now that's causing some problems, okay, that we're dealing with now. Whether it's the Europeans going after Google and other companies um, in the tech space, I think what's at the heart of it for countries is how do they tax? And until countries deal with that and get some alignment, uh, we're going to have friction. Fantastic. Well, I, I, I hope panelists will stay around a little bit if there's some questions, but we'll take. But let me begin by thanking the, the generous support of eBay. And again, uh, Usman Ahmed, thank you so much for being an important partner. Kati, fantastic job, a great report. And for those data nerds out there, very rich. Uh, to our panelists, Alan, Marianne, Jim, thank you so much. We've appreciated your, your engagement in this process. And thank you to our audience for being uh, very attentive and engaged. We look forward to more conversations about how we fuel this online revolution. Have a great day and a great weekend. Thank you.